We start off with an important series between Granite Gaming and the Monkeys as they make sure they don't fall into a position where the Crucible can be a legitimate thing for them to worry about. I know we're five weeks out, but this series is important, and Granite Gaming, they seem to be swinging a bit harder as they go up 2-0. to zero. Yeah, And you say that we're five weeks out, but it's already important, and we've been literally saying that from day one of mm -hmm. Phase 2 because people always neglect to realize how important every single map win is. Every time you're going to a Western Clash or to BlizzCon at the end before, like at the final play day, we're always talking about how a single map matters, how a single match makes all the difference here. So it really comes down to day one already because our seasons are not all that long between the offline events. So there's a lot where every single play that you make can decide of whether you go to an offline event or not. And already, as you said, teams are looking for a good position for the playoffs for BlizzCon, but it's also about the Crucible. And for the Monkeys, things are not looking all too pretty with them now being 0-2 against Granite Gaming in this series. Yep, Monkeys made some good steps in game number two, but now it's time to get results as we head to game number three. And we'll be moving to Battlefield of Eternity. Monkeys with a choice, first pick to Granite Gaming. Yeah, I have a tough time understanding today why certain maps are picked. Uh, um, both of these teams are 0-2 and 0-3 on the map. Today is really one of those days where everybody is looking at the maps and they're saying like, all right guys, which was in part one the map where we didn't get a single win? Let's change that today. And we had that already with both teams being 0-4 on Tomb, so that changed now, of course, for Granite Gaming. But yeah, that break apparently was used by the teams to reevaluate a little bit their strategies and their power levels on certain maps. And they've now come into part two and have said, okay, we studied, we took some time and maybe changed our shot calling a little bit or the way that we draft and we approach a map. And that's why we like certain maps now more, even though in the first part we had no success there. And Battlefield of Eternity is a bit more team fight heavy, so yeah. I think that might be the reasoning behind the choice from uh, Monkey's perspective. But yeah, both of them so far without a single win there, but that's going to change now for one of them. This battleground has definitely changed a lot in terms of what you're seeing in terms of compositions. You mentioned team fights being a thing, but also the ability just to straight up dive your opponent has become even more prevalent. That's kind of born out of Hanzo being strong on this battleground. A lot of teams have been moving into the Maevs, the Rels, the Muradins, trying to force fights. And speaking about Maev, Granite Gaming will banner out pretty quickly. Now we're looking towards Genji as a ban. We're looking towards um, Hanzo being potentially banned out here too. We've seen a very heavy focus on Phoenix bands from the Monkeys in the second spot. So that's something that I want to keep my eyes on a little bit because it was still feeling a bit odd considering that Monkeys played the hero quite a bit in uh, part one. Are they going to ban Phoenix again? Yep. They are not feeling four-legged creature. I seriously want them in the winner's interview right now because I don't understand why. They played Phoenix a lot in part one and Granite Gaming, they are very, very unsuccessful with Phoenix. So what's the thought process here? Why are you all of a sudden hating so much on that hero? Talking about hating, we have Zeratul being picked here super early. Granite Gaming definitely feeling uh, the uh, Protoss now. Very early. Zeratul coming in there. The good thing about him is you can leave him in the top lane if you need to, and he can do well on this battleground due to the ability they not really have a laning face. So Zeratul comes out, denies it from the monkeys, and that is going to be an adjustment. Heard and it turns back for the monkeys, and we go straight into a Rainer afterwards. All right, Meridian into Jimmy. There's good auto attack damage already coming out. If you go Hyperion, you can... I mean, uh, here you can make the uh, argument for both. We've seen a lot of Banshees, we've seen Hyperions as well. If you really try to force an Immortal, you can do that quite easily with a Hyperion here. If you're not focusing that much on the team fight, but you're trying to rush down the objective. Let's see how Granite reacts to that. Beaming and Urel. Liking the Urel pick. Again, the main reason why I really like Urel is something that we talked about earlier. Granite hasn't played Urel in part one. Now they started to pick the hero up. They look good with that, but just that they are now capable of playing the hero, which should be a no-brainer considering how strong Urel is, is absolutely fantastic. I really like it. It gives them more flexibility, and it also shows that Darkmog now adjusted to the current meta and doesn't only go for those personal preferences that he has. And you think goats are cute? Excuse me? And you think goats are cute? Yes, you can admit that's, that. That's true as well. You have to make sure you put it all together. The whole entire argument needs to be out there, man. Don't hide things from people. I forgot all of our goat facts. I actually wanted to come in with a goat fact and want to present you with one. I was like, did you know by the way? And then I thought about it and I was like, I forgot everything. Goats have better milk than 2% milk. It's better for your health and has more fiber. What about 3% milk? 
I don't know about that one. I'll also run the numbers on it. <laughs> Diablo and Abather banned out. Abather making a ban on BOE. Okay. Orphis coming in. You know what, uh, what Alex is on? Bring yeah. Back in oldie but goldie. Do you think he's going to be playing main tank Orthus, or is he going to be going nah, for gonna... Arthur? Let the Inquisition commence. Uh -huh. Arthur. Cindergosa Arthus is what I name him. Uh, uh, okay, why? Mm -hmm. It's just funny. It's a little funny. Not even a little bit. I'm, I'm not thinking of the joke here. Like, I, I, I'm, I, I, Arthas is this big, powerful Lich King that dominates all, and yes. Arthur is that guy in Hero League that picks Cindergoso when you need a main tank. That's Arthur. Okay. All right? It sure. It's a thing. Okay. Whatever you say, to it. You're snickered. It's a little funny. I'm just trying to get away from the conversation here because it's hella awkward. <laughs> All right, so White Man, Arthas together, Garrosh, and Deckard Kane will be the fourth and fifth pickup for Granite Gaming. I honestly want Sinragosa. I'm done with Arthur. No. Stop smirking, just no. Whoa! Oh. Uh, okay. Simultaneously a yikes and a hype for me. Kelpazod coming out on BOE, and this is before Kelpazod got reworked. He's not a uh, CC bot, he's actually a damage bot if he can finish his quest on BOE, which is kind of late game oriented on a battleground that if you fail in the early game, you could lose quickly. Against Zeratul, Urel, Garrosh, you mean? It's a hopeful pick, but I'm hopeful it works, because Kel'Thuzad in HEC is pretty high. Yeah. You're not feeling it. Not even a little bit. <laughs> Not even a little bit. <laughs> Not even a little bit. I mean, again, think about the value on the level 4 talent. When you get your region globes all collected, you can die and come back. It's like an earlier mouthfeel. <laughs> kind of. Against Zaratul, Urel, <laughs> Leaving and Garrosh. Chains and whips don't excite you, Kaldor? Is that what I'm hearing right oh, now? Oh, chains and whips really excite me, but Kaldor, that doesn't. Yikes, can we go in again? <laughs> you walked into that one, I'm sorry. I, but like, I had to deliver. I wanted it to be subtle, and you're like, no, here's a hammer. That, set, that <laughs> setup was way too good. Here we go. Game number three, Granite Gaming versus the Monkeys. On the left side in the blue, Granite Gaming. Wolf Joel playing Decker Kane, Nande on Garrosh, Dark Muck on Yorel, Memecraft on Lee Ming, and Raid Boss on Zeratul. Well, Tim hates on me because I like it rough. We have to the right side of the map, the Monkey Menagerie with Crosby on Arena. Maka on Kel'Thuzad. Alex, the pro G, finds himself in Arthur's, obviously. Remember Bola on Murden. And Splendor on White Mane. KTC, he's in. Well, let's look at his build here. Level 1 talent coming in, barbed chains. Pretty typical what you'll see from a lot of Kel'Thuzad's, at least in the older Kel'Thuzad's. Being able to reduce the armor of heroes that you pop in by 15 is always great when you're trying to go for those one-shot combos when you finish off your quest. So we'll keep an eye on that. You'll need a total of 30 stacks so you can gain 75% spell power, and that's when that one-shot potential can come online. If you get to that point, this hero can definitely make all the difference. Yep. I mean, there is CC also. We have Howling Blast after Storm Bolts. There is definitely a lot of tools that you have where you can set up for a lot of Kel'Thuzad damage to come out. So that's definitely a thing. I'm just worried of Make ever getting there because Granite Gaming knows that too, and they should be able to dodge a lot of it and then just simply try and blow Kel'Thuzad up through the Zeratul Li Ming URL combo. One of the things about a Kel'Thuzad team is that you gotta make sure you protect him, but you also gotta make sure you get off those combos. The issue is that in competitive play, whenever Kel'Thuzad is played, usually after he pops out a combo, they are gonna all in on the target. And look at that. Make tosses out the chain, here comes the flank, and we're having Raid Boss try to kill him, but boy, Splendor kept him alive. I love how Wolf Joe, the old man with Deckard Kane, was just running after Kel'Thuzad with a <laughs> stick and trying to hit him. <laughs> I got this. Yeah. And then at some point he was just like, oh, I think I'm all alone right now. I should probably back <laughs> off here. But yeah. It was definitely the attempt to collapse on Demaki here, and that's something that we're going to see a lot more often. The cool thing about Kalthazard is if you control, like if you are the the team that initiates, that pushes in with the objective, 
you can really do a lot. The chains alone and all the setup around it really allows you to siege up extremely well into an opponent. So if they grab the Immortal and are able to siege into uh, the gra into Grenade Gaming Squad with Kalthazard, that has a lot of potential momentum going for you. Yeah. So uh, that's something that Grenade Gaming has to be very aware of. You also need to be aware of this because we're seeing you're having a camp steal happening up at the top and a nice setup. Yamak is actually doing work. Yeah, he's got some chains here, sitting in a total of seven stacks so far. Nanda comes around for a flank, though, and finds Make. Gets the damage in, Raid Boss helps as well, and Granite Gaming will be able to get a pick. But a total of eight stacks so far of the 30 needed for Make. It's just a bit of a momentum question here as well, right? Because once that Granite Gaming gets the objective, if they can secure the Immortal, Kalthusar doesn't really do that well on the defense. He's much better on the aggressive side when you're pushing in and you can use structures as a setup for your chain. And after we have the Barb Chain on level 1, we're now seeing the armor of the Arch Lich taken as the level 4 talent. With White Main, by the way, we are still seeing the exact same build that we have already seen a few times here today. Yep. Stacking heavily into the Desperate Plea, so if you guys just tuned in, we have it on level 1 now with the Martyrdom, and on level 4 with the Unwavering Faith, and usually see it reflected in the level 16 talent choice as well. Kethelsod, after he uses his abilities, becomes a magic carp. He just splashes around, hoping his teammates can help him until he gets more CC coming in. But boy, monkeys are doing well with him so far. He comes in, gets another combo, Dark Muscle low on health, Splinter's there to help him out every single time. And we have him moving up in stacks, 11 out of the 30, but Zeratul in the bottom lane is making a splash himself. Yeah, exactly. Zeratul is the one that we really have to watch out for because he is getting mad value for his team right now. And Arthur's rotated really, really late. So Alex is coming in, but the problem is that already half of the wall is gone. And that's a pretty solid chunk of experience that we just saw tickling into the hands of Granite Gaming. And that helps him with a half-level lead right now. And also, nice controller. Zeratul is still waiting for the rotation to happen. And once that Arthas is starting to make his way top, he should be able to get some free damage in. Now, we've been talking about late game for Kel'Thuzad, but don't forget about the late game for Zeratul as well. Now, while Zeratul's been in the shadows this entire time pushing out the lanes, he's just building up for that level 16. And when he gets to that 16, he'll be able to jump on the back line where both White Mane, Rainer, Kel'Thuzad will be living, and he'll be dropping out the damage quickly. Granite Gaming going to be building towards that. We'll also put some damage on top of the Immortal. The race going over to Granite Gaming so far as Nande buys some time here with a couple of swaps while Crosby starts to try to slow down that gap. Yeah, Marcus still gets a few stacks together. He's sitting at 12th right now. I mean, the team fight that we're seeing here definitely helps with that. Remember, Bola and Alex are both protecting. I mean, that's the beauty of having Arthas and Muradin at the front. You have a lot of uh, sustainable front line here. But Make is so low and he's taken out immediately. Your both tanks don't really do anything for you if you, they get just circumvented and your opponent walks past them. Now we're having Muradin fall as a result here shortly after now too. And that's another double kill picked up by Granite Gaming as they're looking at three kills versus zero. Early level seven talent and now open season on the Immortal. Some good picks from Grinning Gaming, but that ticking bomb continues to tick away 15 out of 30 on the Blight stacks here. So the first actual reward you get will be coming online with those 15 stacks, which is the cooldown reduction coming in at by two seconds for everything. Yep. So Kel'Thuzad will be able to chain out those combos quicker. And of course, level seven is when he gets that spike, which allows for him to set up his own combos naturally. I mean, a lot of the idea on the draft of Monkey Menagerie really hinges upon the ability to keep Kel'Thuzad alive, and that's why we are having that Arthur's Murder in front line. It's so difficult to go through them if it's a linear setup, but especially with Zeratul, the thought process of Granite was always to move around the tank line and jump straight onto Kel'Thuzad, and that's exactly what we saw for that last kill. So Marke has to be super careful here. And now we're finding ourselves in that situation that I was talking about earlier. If you are actually defending with Kel'Thuzad, it's a lot more difficult than when you're sieging into an opponent. So that Immortal is definitely bound to get at least some work done here at the top. Already get a turret, grabs a gate, grabs a second turret too, and now we're on our way towards the fort. Nande stepping up and he's looking for a combo. Crosby playing with fire, but he's got Rimmer in the front line to hold it down for him. He'll get tossed, but he'll be able to jump away. But the main issue is that fort being destroyed. It goes down to about a quarter health and should be cleaned up. There we go. Big jump in experience for Granite Gaming. Yeah, they are heading into level 10 now. Nine and a half versus level eight, looking strong for them. We have on level seven, Ice Coal taken for Kalthazard. Uh, sorry, the Glacial Spike taken for him. Yep, which will give him the ability to, of course, drop that spike there. 
allows for him to combo out the combos. And it's cool about that too is he can drop it down as a way to block someone from retreating. It's got a pretty big hitbox as well. And you have a four second duration on it too. So you can play that game with chicken. You just drop it down and say, all right, are you gonna come near this area? And then see if they try to force a fight. And if they do, of course, you can follow up with a chain afterwards. Nice little tool in the arsenal for Keltasad. And talking about the level 7 talents, we have Intercession now taken for White Mane, and that's of course her cleanse variation that we have now. Another really important tool when you're trying to keep Keltasad alive. So this is definitely something where White Mane together with Jimmy, uh, sorry, with um, Muradin and Arthur is going to have to do over a time to make sure that Keltasad doesn't die here. And it's going to be pretty tricky. So level 10 connects. Void Prison being available will be the thing that we'll keep an eye on. Nine just hitting for the monkeys, and they are in a really awkward situation with these immortals about to spawn up. Granted, gaming though playing with fire here. On one front, you have the ability to open up these gates and take on this well, which you take away from the monkeys, but on the other front, you're giving more opportunities for Kelpazaw to keep in those stacks in, and he's currently sitting at 24. Yeah, but I still like it. That well is so important for the later stages of the game, and them being this aggressive and taking it out is mm. actually awesome. We've seen this a lot with Genji in the early game, where you see a Genji player dive back into that and take the fountain out. And once you have big sustainable fights in the middle of the map where someone might be forced back to tap at that fountain, this is where the real value of that move unfolds. But now having that in play and sacrificing a few stacks of Kalthuzad, I actually still think that's totally worth it. But as you said, once those stacks are completed and we have level 10 in here, there is a lot of one-shot potential for Kalthuzad, and that's what Granite Gaming needs to be uh, very aware of. Yep, that Shadow Fisher about to come online. 10 about to connect for the monkeys. They were able to hold their own. Granite Gaming open up this immortal phase though by putting some damage out. They spread out immediately too. They are afraid of monkeys possibly coming in here and forcing a full engage. And there's the 10 versus 10 now, so this is really the time to shine here. Maka is going to look for the damage, and at the same time, if Garrosh, for example, gets close enough to Kel'Thuzad to drop the taunt, that should be the end of him. And especially with Zeratul here in the Void Prism isolation, there's a lot of tools available to them. And Stubble being used, nice connect here again, but no follow-up damage. Memecraft needs to be careful as he's trying to drop those combos out. White Man, in the meantime, is dropping the zeal everywhere, attempting to make sure that everyone is just staying nice and healthy. As we're seeing the fight starting up down here, Darkmok jumping out, gets back, uh, sucked back in, and bops the Adam Defender immediately. Gets healed up too, over half health. Zeratul takes the fort in the bottom lane as he was constantly pushing in during that entire fight. The and he still goes back to it. Yeah, he's just keeping up with it. Granite Gamus says, okay, keep up with the push, man. Don't worry about it. You're getting an experience lead. We can fight on the halftime show if we need to. Monkeys are grouped up as a team fight. They can't really split anybody off here. If they were to, it would be Arthas, but that would leave Kepelzad exposed. And Granite Gaming is exploiting that. Yeah, Zeratul is doing massive damage at the bot lane with the Shaman Camp here. And now we have Arthas in trouble. Alex needs to be careful. He's not the only one. Mark is immediately low as Raid Pulse is starting to move in from the side. Darkmok jumping in Zeratul. deep. And here comes Zeratul. And he is just tracking, setting up the Void Prison. And here's the follow-up. Oh, that just... Lord NATO. <laughs> Oh my, that Lord Nato. Oh my god. The carnage as White Main Reina and Kel'Thuzad just explode. Alex on the run. The only way that he has to go is into a fort of the opponent. That was brutal. Something to note, despite we just fought the monkeys get completely destroyed in that team fight, is that Kalest is now done here for Kel'Thuzad. Let's Look go ahead and take out this fight, though. So the big VP comes in. Look at Raid Boss sharking around. Goes in for the cleave, gets the damage. Big VP, Yorel hopping in. And then the Lord Nato just to suck anybody in like a Hoover. That is absolutely insane. I mean, the boss alone already delivering one of those kills, but oh my god. That was beautiful, like that setup. The Void Prism just as Urel jumps in the Lornado. <laughs> that was that was absolutely beautiful. That was one of the best executed combos that we've seen in quite some time. Granite Gaming just destroying the monkeys here. Well, now we have an Immortal. A pretty healthy one too, quite robust as it pushes the top lane. They showed them a banana, they lured them in, <laughs> and then they closed the trap behind them. You want some potassium? Here's some potassium. Oh wait, VP Lordado. Monkeys are in a spot where they're trying to defend against a push coming their way. They'll try to yoink out Dark Mock, but he's able to escape while Granite Gaming sets up for a push in the top lane. And that Immortal is chunking. Dark Mark, ah, oh, nice combo. damage. Once again, here comes the combo. Marker actually starting to deliver. Nanda with a stun and White Mane popping the old Scarlet Aegis being used here. 
they are really scared and for very, very good reason. Once again, Maka delivering here on Kel'Thuzad, but the problem is he, they can't confirm any kills. They can't secure those. Nande is low, but so is that keep. And we're having, again, the Fisher coming out as Nande is about to fall, but still walks away. No one able to secure that kill. Remabon is trying, though. Let's go with the potions, and here's a VP, too. Rimmer will get focused down, a little bit of damage here, no major follow-up. Memecraft finds himself alone by himself here on the right side, trying to escape, but will get cleaned up. But here comes Cindergosa as Arthur drops the dragon. Arthur goes in, and Hirmaru comes out and drops at least Li Ming. Garrosh dies too. But the problem is the keep is gone and you're still two levels behind. The 13 talent is close though for the monkeys as they are trying to get some value at the top lane to finally get that additional experience. So 13 connects for the monkeys. There is still the one-shot potential available for Maka. He used it twice in that team fight. He got members low. Decker Kane did a really good job of dropping in those heals and providing those potions. And of course, Ardent Defender was used too. But something to consider is that you can actually use that combo, force out that Ardent Defender, and then re-engage a good 15 seconds later and be able to go for another one-shot. And Monkeys will be trying to pull that off. Meanwhile, on this side, Grammic Gaming, they're about to hit level 16, and we already talked about it. Zeratul at 16, scary. Exactly, especially for Marke. Marke already died three times. He's the hero in the game with the most deaths with his Kel'Thuzad. He's also the hero with the most damage by far, though, sitting on 24,000. And basically everything, starting with his quest and also going down to his uh, level 4, his level 13 talent, is all about cooldown reduction, spell power increase, just getting that extra damage out there. And as long as they can keep Marke alive, he is going to be able to deliver through the Fissure on level 10, too. That's definitely something that we have to watch out for here. Dark Lord just wow. steals the camp away, goes in and says, like, hi, Urel, by the way, and takes the camp. Now they're trying to go for Rema Baller, and they might actually be able to get that kill here. Barely able to move out after he pops the avatar. But VP and Ray Boss is another cleave. Boom, there goes the pickoff. Look at Alex Apogee as well. That's going to be a second pick, too. Kethelzad looking for a combo. Alex actually able to sneak out while Rimmer hops on in. And Maka is getting the damage numbers out there. He's really doing work, but the problem is they just can't get the kills. He just got a 7,000 damage in that last fight. That was a huge chunk of hit points that he was able to just dish out there. But the problem is he still didn't get the kill. It's Reyna who falls because Li Ming is getting those combos off. So with all that damage done, we now have the halftime show also won by Granite Gaming. And we have one keep already down. So if the next Immortal, if this Immortal falls, then there's very likely going to be a second keep that dies on the side of the monkeys. And Granite Gaming is content to play this slow as long as they're not getting comboed by Maka. With having Mirrorball come online for Li Ming, they're able to chunk down this Immortal quickly. They already have it down to half health. They play defense, they wait for everyone to assess where they're at. They also grab the camp to have it pushing on that bottom keep in the bottom right. Especially with Marco and Kel'Thuzad, it all comes down to positioning. Yep. This is why Memecraft is at the side here, trying to angle for the Immortal, but also to see if they can maybe get a straight line onto Marke, onto Kel'Thuzad. Zeratul is waiting for that. And again, Granite Gaming is very well playing with uh, wave control. They're down, going down to the bot lane with a Shaman camp that they have, and Zeratul just keeps pushing that in. Talking about pushing it in, we have currently two catapults going straight Straight for the core at the top lane. Yep, they're already on top of the core, working on the armor. Monkeys feel like they have to fight here. They're going for a combo. They're going to hit the chain. Same time, Maka, however, gets destroyed in the back line. Raid boss and the help of the Immortal are able to clean it up. Nande's low on health, but that's a Garrosh with 35 armor. He should be just fine. Yeah, and right now we're having catapults homing on the core again. The bot lane camp is doing tons of damage, going straight for the keep now, already before we're even having the Immortal secured. So Granite Gaming could very well just go straight for the core if they take the objective here. That keep at the bot lane is already falling. Yep, down a half health. Here comes Cinder Ghost from behind. Uh, and nobody. Feels like they thought somebody may have been hit in the bush and we're trying to surprise him, but... I think with White Mane there, they were hoping for someone to actually go straight in and uh, try to hit them, so mm -hmm. I feel it was one of those... Um, Hail Marys? <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a trap, Cinder Ghost, <laughs> like, I don't know. Well, it's Immortal time, and Granite Gaming on the cusp of ending this series with a 3-0. to zero. Can the monkeys find a kill? Oh no, Make overextended here. <laughs> Drop down the combo. Brutal. But they do get Li Ming. 
Yeah, Liming goes down, so it's a one-for-one one trade, but that Immortal is not going to stop anytime soon. It's already on the way, and the keep is about to fall here. Darkmok jumping out, but he is actually about to die. Urel goes down, and that might be the Monkeys with a chance of defending. It's not going to be easy for them, but this is still an early Immortal. The keep goes down, and now it's time for the core to take some damage, but the Monkeys have actually a small chance of saving the game, at least for the time being. Crosby has to be careful, though. Raid Boss is just cleaning up. He goes free for Splendor, too. Splendor! He gets the safety VP pop. Popped out for Radar 2, and Granite Gaming will turn their attention to the core, and it's starting to fall. This Immortal is healthy and ready to go. Here's Make hoping to land a combo, and he will. There is one, maybe a second. Nande picked off two. Raid Boss cleaves away, but the Immortal stands firm, and that is going to be the core picked off as Granite Gaming goes up 3-0. to zero. Great job by Granite Gaming here. Definitely a bit of uh, an experimental draft on the side of the monkeys. Mm. High risk, high reward. If they can keep Maka alive, then he's going to be able to do a lot of work. We saw that towards the late game. But at the same time, it was also very obvious what the downside is of playing with Kel'Thuzad. It's the survivability of the heroes. Five deaths against Kel'Thuzad. And towards the end, Reyna even overtook him in the damage department. Yep, the weakness of after dropping your CDs. You have no way to really deal with your opponent coming your way unless your teammates can protect you. And it's hard to get to Zeratul, right? You can't blame his teammates for not being able to save all of that, right? It's too difficult for him to be jumping in with the wormholes and the speeds coming out. I was actually surprised more so than anything else that they picked uh, Kel'Thuzad into Zeratul. Mm. You had Arthas with you, so I feel they had the thought, okay, Arthas is going to be able to control Zeratul to an extent. Yeah. But that was definitely a risk. Sure. To a Liming plus Zeratul, that felt like something where they maybe went into the draft. I mean, don't get me wrong, they picked actually the map. So I feel from the get-go, they had the thought process of, hey, we're going to pick VOE, sure. we have a Kel'Thuzad combo that we can use, and then all of a sudden Zeratul gets picked on the other side, and like, okay, that makes it a bit more difficult, but do we really have anything else here? And I feel they were already set on the idea of playing this, that they yep. still follow through with it. And the setup that we had for Granite was just great. I mean, part of it, too, was Granite Gaming and their adjustment to make sure that they're not actually fighting in the middle of the map. They pushed the bottom yeah. lane out. They were making sure that Zeratul was being a bit of a nuisance. They were building towards the late game. They were content going that route, knowing they had a solid late game. Granite Gaming overall, when it came to BOE, just played this really well and make sure not to get one shot, which is the one saving grace that Kel'Thuzad brings in to a composition. They just made sure it never got performed fully, and that's why they were able to get the win. I like what you point out. I mean, we talked about this during the game, but every time we had the shaman camp timed perfectly well on the side of granite gaming and then they rotated raid boss down cleaved the wave yeah and even stayed there after they took the wave out if there was no immediate engagement on the other side like normally what happens is you have a hero appearing on a lane and the opponent's team immediately says like all right guys it's time to go it's a five versus four in the middle let's make a move right now Monkeys didn't always do that. And so when they didn't make the move, then Zeratul just said, okay, I'm going to stay down here. I'm going to wait for the next wave. I'm going to take that out too. Even more value through our camp, and we take an experienced lead on top of that. So they really controlled the map extremely well. Well, we have Nande here from Granite Gaming to talk about their 3-0 victory over the Monkeys. Nande, congratulations uh -huh. on your big victory day, continuing to do well on the tank roll. Uh, I got to straight up ask you as we come out, uh, the Kel'Thuzad pick in game number three, how terrified were you guys of it, or did you guys figure that you have a game plan that could shut it down? Uh, completely terrified, first of all. Thanks, uh, thanks, hey guys. And yeah, when the Kel'Thuzad was locked in, honestly, blood was pumping through all the veins, heart beat <laughs> faster. Uh, we know that these guys uh, have a lot of practice on that hero, so we weren't super sure what to expect with it. But we had to respect it and deal with it. Turns out it didn't do that much. So lucky for that one. How do you even prepare for a random pick like that to come out? Do you just as a team calm each other down? Do you change your game plan? I, I kind of want to get the thoughts of how you handle that once it gets locked in. Well, we were expecting some wonky picks to come out, honestly. I kind of choked in the draft already. We're going to have like a throwback to Chogal like one year ago, mm -hmm. or even longer when we played on the Playing Ducks roster that they, in the third game, picked Chogal and it completely backfired on them. And they bring out Diva sometimes on the map. So, yeah, we did expect them to bring something. So we just said, okay, it's a random Kel'Thuzad. It's not even the new version. So we're not that scared of it. And we just try to stay calm and play around it. And we didn't have very clean games today, but overall we won, so yeah, happy about that. Awesome. Well, over to Kaldor. 
Well, you talked a bit about not having very clean games today, and I want to come back to one of them, to Tomb of the Spider Queen in particular. It felt that in the mid game, you guys lost your head a little bit. You uh, lost a hero to a hook, and then you still stayed into a four versus five. The next hook comes in, connects again, you lose another one. And then towards the uh, later stages of the game, you it feel like you guys calmed down and you just played it a little more disciplined, and then your combos come out where you have one CC after another, good horrifies coming in, uh, setups with blessed shield into a silence. Was in the mid game? Was that you guys panicking a little bit? Was that just what what happened there? And how did you guys fix it and approach the late game with a bit more of a calmer state? Well, I feel like it was kind of a snowball setup that happened because I think I didn't press unstoppable one time on a hook, and then from that they got a chain and a kill situation on us, and so they got a couple turn-ins in a row on that. But I think Dark Morgan in the mid game made some really good plays on Maltel to get the counter kills when we got engaged, and later on or and Raid Boss with the fear setups was there to get the counter kills on Keltos. So in the middle of the game we were like, okay, just calm down, we stop dying, we regroup, even if they get a boss, which we thought they would do at some point, we can just defend and play late game. And we did, yeah, not play that game out very well. Of course, we should have snowballed that harder and we didn't do much with one turn in, but yeah, we stick to playing calm and didn't win in the end with a good fear on Keltos in mid lane. Uh, you guys were really, really close of making it to uh, the Western Clash. There was always an, uh, an option, at least, until the last play day. So now with the victory over the Monkeys, you also made sure that you are very, very far away from the Crucible. I guess there's still a theoretical chance that you can fall down there. But what's the realistic, what's the realistic uh, goal for you guys now when you're looking at Part 2 or Phase 2? Well, our, that our goal, our main goal, like you said from the start, is we want to avoid Crucible. That's the most important thing. And But then I think we do have a lot of potential, which we already showed, but we also can see that that we have a lot of things still to fix, a lot of issues to fix. The first phase of the season was a big learning process for us with the roster, or with the new roster and with the role swap that we made in the middle of the season. And like the last two losses against Liquid and Leftovers were pretty rough on us, I would say, and a rough lesson for me to learn on the new role as well. So as long as we just keep improving and working on our mistakes and we have a good atmosphere to do that with, I think that everything is possible. And our goal is just approach every season or every match, I mean, uh, with a clear mindset and try to do our best and win and see where it takes us. It feels like you guys hit a massive, massive power spike once that you made actually the switch in roles. We talked about this already a little bit in uh, part one of phase two. But just coming back to that, how comfortable do you feel currently on uh, the tank position? And uh, why do you feel this was such a big impact on uh, the results that you guys have as a team? Well, I, I, I do feel comfortable, but I'm definitely not yet where I want to be. And I think it was a good change because it kind of complements a bit more our personalities, how we interact and have a good dynamic in the team with each other. Mm -hmm. And playing around a bit more, uh, are we playing a bit more around vision than before? And the hero pools are kind of fitting a bit more. Even though the heroes that I especially disliked now, Chromie, for example, is gone from that role. Uh, okay. But yeah, I think those are the main reasons, like just having a bit better team dynamic and Raidbus is making good plays on the range draw. So happy with how it's going right now. All right, thank you very much. And yeah, looking forward to the next games that you guys play in the future and uh, good luck for them. Oh, thank you very much. Nande, let's take a look at your schedule for the next few weeks. I want you to let me know, what are the must wins for your team here as you continue to go out through the next few weeks? Well, obviously a must win for us is still as a direct competitor or 20 series. Okay. So that that is the situation where we're saying, okay, like if we win this one, then I guess we're pretty certain out of the Crucible range, which was our main goal from the start. But also, like I mentioned before, we want to approach every series with, with just giving our best because I think we have a good potential to go up against uh, the middle of the pack teams as well. So, yeah, we just want to give our best and see how far we can go. Is there one team on the schedule that in particular you personally want to beat? Uh, we want to beat all of them. Okay, but, fair enough. Uh, per, but on a personal level, you know, we're good friends with the Leftovers guys, so that's, that's always a good banter match for us. So that's one that I'm looking forward to. And again, it's like the last match of the season for us, like it was the last time. So it's going to be a good highlight.
Awesome. Well, we look forward to it as well. I'm going to go ahead and let you go so you can prepare your match for Team Liquid, which will be on Sunday. But go ahead and take the floor. Uh, Shoutouts are now yours to take. All right, I'm on the floor. So uh, shout out to all of you guys supporting us out there, watching right now in the Twitch chat. Special shout out to uh, Tastingo and the boys on the German Blizz Heroes channel. Thank you all for the moral support that we get from you guys. It's amazing. Big shout out to Granite Gaming, our sponsor, and a uh, big shout out to my teammates for performing today. Um, it wasn't as clean as we would like it to, but uh, we'll definitely work out everything and uh, do better in the next time. Congrats to Granite Gaming as they get a 3-0 victory over the Monkeys today. But that attitude is definitely something that we enjoy seeing here in the HCC. Hey, we may have gotten a 3-0, but it was not as clean as we like. Very German. Very German, yeah. This wasn't perfect. This, was <laughs> this is not satisfactory yet. <laughs> <laughs> Calador and his efficiency, man. This guy is so... Okay, why am I telling you this story? This guy is so efficient that when I come to Where pick him up in the morning, it? he is at the bus stop seven minutes before the planned time to actually pick him up. He just stayed on the corner, ready to okay, go. This is literally like the... I mean, stereotypes are there for a reason to a large part, right? So uh, there's always a kernel of truth. Mm. And basically, every German that I know, when you... Uh, when you arrange a meeting at a certain point, yeah. a German is going to be there five minutes early. That's that's just how you do. Yeah, no, that's true. That's I great. mean, that's at least, uh, it has been very true not only for me, but for most of the Germans that I know. I mean, it's a good trait to have, that's for sure. Yeah. Well, guys, we are done here on this Friday. We'll be back tomorrow with more HTC action. But until next time, enjoy HTC North America. Fernande and Marke is in a really bad spot. Portal comes out and he's trying to move away from it. The portal control through the tornado and also Condemn is pretty solid though. Remapola doesn't have souls on Diablo and that should be the end of him. But Illidan falls first as we have Jimmy and Diablo both die. The rest of the team is not looking too hot either. Down they go. All five taken off the map and be the target. She is pulled back. She still has her iron skin available. Can turn around and drop that buzzard shield. Here comes the condemn. Mean craft afterwards comes up and steps with Donald Texas. Yeah, there's the roots. Nanda is about to go down. Can they get a counter kill? Yes, they can. Down goes Deckard Kane. Side of Granite Gaming's mid key, but outside of that, we're just waiting for that first kill to happen. The kids know about it all. And the one time that we don't normally talk about with Junkra, hang on, actually, fight in the middle as Yorel is going to be taken out. Rimmer trying to kite away. Darkbot wanting to move in with a chase goes in, tries to slow him down a little bit, maybe go for a body block, but it has to be a little wonderful as he has to be careful with the low amount of health that he has. And that's the setup Horrify. for the Horrify is in. That's the second kill. And this is exactly what we've been talking about all game long though. Yeah. And now we have Arthur's in trouble. Alex needs to be careful. He's not the only one. Marcus immediately low as Raypulse is starting to move in from the side. Dartmoor jumping in Seratool. deep and here comes Seratool and he is just tracking, setting up the Void Prison and here's the follow-up. Oh, that just... Lord Nato. <laughs> oh my, that Lord oh Nato. Oh my god. The carnage as White Main Reina and Kel'Thuzar just...